Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I am Jamie Melma. I'm the scenic designer here at University Theater, and I also oversee a lot of the, the land of paint. So um, today we're talking a lot about texture, and we're going to talk about um, both physical texture and painted texture, which is a lot to cover. So we're going to hopefully get through it all, but I can't guarantee. Um, we're going to start with physical textures because those kind of have to go down first if they um, are going to exist. And then if not, then we'll go to a uh, painted texture. And if we don't make it through it all, we'll maybe do another one of these with, to finish it off. So what are scenic textures? And well, hold up. First of all, disclaimer, these are sort of my tricks and trades, right? Like, Everybody has a lot of their own. A lot of scenic painters have a lot of their own things that they do. There are, of course, some standard stuff. And I'm going to touch on a bunch of that. But, you know, this is not all there is to know about scenic painting for sure, or scenic textures. So, uh, yeah, a little disclaimer about that. Um, so, yeah, what are these textures and why do we use them? And the reason we have texture is such an important thing for scenic painting is because on stage, stage lighting tends to wash out a lot of surfaces. So we have to sort of simulate surfaces or exaggerate surfaces in order for them to really read on stage in the way that they would in reality. There really is no smooth surface in existence. I mean, okay, so there's glass, right? But glass is reflection. So there's not a lot of natural smooth surfaces. So pretty much everything on stage has to have a little bit of texture. And I'll admit I sometimes cut corners and don't do texture when I should, but like, for instance, even if you look at your um, painted wall that might be next to you of your home, there's going to be a little dappling on that surface from the, from the paint, the texture of the paint on the wall. And that catches light. And our eyes are used to seeing that. So that means we need to replicate that in some way on stage. Otherwise, it doesn't look correct to our eye. That's why texture and, and, texture and scenery is so important, um, even if it's just light. So um, if you see me looking down, all my great notes are over here. So. so we have to do that with actual a real texture to exaggerate it, or we, we simulate it with paint. So I have a good example. I have a lot of examples. I'm going to be doing a lot of photos off the computer, some real samples. I'm going to demonstrate a bunch of things. But if you have questions about anything, I've got Dave Jensen on the Q&A. So do put questions in the Q&A box, right? And uh, he'll interrupt me and ask her questions. So if you see something and you have a question about it, let me know. Or if I do something and you have a question about it, just let me know, okay? All right. This is an example of why texture is important. I'm going to put this down here. This is painted flat. And the surface is painted completely with texture. And it's only the depth that's created here is only created with highlight and shadow. So you've only got black and white essentially making uh, the highlight and shadow of this image. And the rest has got all that texture going on to make it feel like it actually belongs in the world. So that is one example of how slash why texture is so important. So a question might be, how do you know, like, should I do real physical texture or do I do painted texture? And the answer is going to have to do with your space and your audience. If you are in a smaller space, it probably means more texture might be necessary because your audience is going to be a lot closer to your surfaces, whether that's the floor or the walls or whatever your piece of scenery might be. In a bigger space or a proscenium house where everything is much further away or the audience is further away, you can get away with more simulated stuff because they're further away. It, it's not going to, the real texture is not going to read anyway. So it's, it's a little bit of give and take in that area in terms of figuring that out, but those, that's a big, one of the main factors. Uh, let me also talk a little bit about the paint I use because it's a little different than the kind of paint that you would normally use. So, this is a can of scenic paint. This happens to be Roscoe off Broadway. There's a couple different brands, but there's only a few because it's a pretty specialty thing. And this is paint made specifically for the theater. And the reason that we have our own special paint is because paint, the ratio in the paint is different than say something you might have for your house. So paint you would buy for your house. Well, let me start with this. 
Paint is made up of three things. Well, there's a lot of ingredients, but they add up to three basic things, which is the pigment, right? That's the color. And you've got the binder, which is the glue that makes it stick to things, right? And then you got the vehicle, which makes it move around and not be solid. So you can imagine in like latex paint, the binder is latex, which means rubber. You've got rubber, your walls are coated in rubber. So um, in regular latex house paint, the ratios of those three things are very different. If you've had paint mixed at your, for your home, you'll notice that when they open up the can to put the pigment in, the can is nearly all the way full already, right? So uh, it's almost all the way full. It, there's usually a little bit at the top. So um, that's how much pigment they're putting in it, which is not a lot compared to everything else, right? So you've got this much pigment, the rest is vehicle and binder. So the reason scenic paint is special is that the ratio is different. It has a lot more pigment and less binder and vehicle. Um, so it tends to be a little bit thicker and it tends to have less stickum, which means if you were to paint over top of it with something else, it might come off kind of like watercolor paint. But that's to keep the pigment so really, really strong because if you can, because we tend to thin down paint a lot for scenery, like to achieve that, that is texture and for scenery, we, we tend to want a lot, a lot of layers. They create depth in a space or on a surface. So you have, for instance, you might have a texture down, you might do some highlight and shadow, then you might do some color over that. And it builds up to kind of create the sense of age and time and depth that most surfaces have that you don't even realize because nothing looks like plain flat, flat color. So that means we have to thin paint down a lot. And you can imagine if you have house paint and you try to thin down the tiny little amount of pigment, it's not gonna go very far. Whereas if you have this much pigment, it'll go a lot further. So the color ends up being much stronger and much better than if we um, used house paint because there's just less pigment in house paint. And it doesn't seem like it because it tends to be very strong, but they're using a different kind of pigment, right? It's usually more synthetic. A lot of scenic paint uses natural materials for their paint, which is yay, great for the environment and all that. But that also means if once you mix it with water, sometimes it tends to go bad and then it starts to smell really bad because it's a natural material and it's gross. But um, we try to use it up so it doesn't do that. So another way that we might do this in um, scenery is with super sat paints. It's another different kind. It's much more concentrated. That's it's saturated, right? Super sat. And we, uh, it goes a lot further. You can water this down like one to eight water to pigment and it, it looks still really good. And so this or um, dyes, like this is a, a a dye mostly for um, like silks and things, but um, the same difference. So you're using dyes and thinner colors on items like painted drops, right? Painted backdrops need to be several things, one of which is off, obviously beautiful, but then they need to be light. They need to not be crunchy because ideally that might, if that's on a tour, it's got to go from place to place and they have to fold it up or roll it up. And so you can't have thick, thick, crunchy paint on it or it will really not work for any kind of long term. And it tends to weigh, I mean, it's heavy because it usually drops are really big areas. So dyes and, and super sats are really helpful for that. Dyes are not as safe because they come in powder form usually. So you have to wear a respirator, which is, brings me to my next bit, which is safety. So for when you're using dyes, you might, or like things like spray paint, you might want to use an actual respirator or at the very least a dust mask because this stuff is like dye in powder form is not good for your lungs at all. And uh, you don't want to get it on you, get it in your lungs. So that's, we use a lot of use respirators. Got things like gloves, of course, there's going to be different kinds of gloves for different kinds of paints. But for all of the scenic paints, regular, we use nitrile just instead of latex because a lot of people have allergies and things. So 
things like um, you know, heavier duty paints or heavier duty chemicals, you would need a heavier duty glove. And you can, the ratings for gloves are usually on them when you purchase them. So, um, and we are dust masks as well. These guys, these paints, you know, they tend to be more, uh, more expensive, which is why a lot of smaller theaters and high schools and things tend not to invest in them. But they are an investment and they do last much, much longer because you are thinning them out so much. I say it's worth the investment if you want to slowly start picking up colors. I think it's totally worth it. You, you tend to use them a little bit at a time. I use plain house paint for white and black. Um, not everybody does that, but I do that. And I tend to mix the color into that if I need to like get a particular color for like a base color even. Or you can just buy a base color and regular latex and then paint on top of that too. It just depends on what you're doing. I would not do that for like painted drops, right? For the reasons we talked about earlier. All right, safety and paint done. Um, all right, next, let's get into the actual textures. So we have to prep a lot of surfaces for them to be useful. Um, we, there's a couple different kinds of flats that we use, right? We've got um, like a, tra a traditional theatrical soft cover flat, right? And then we have things like Hollywood style, like our little baby flat right here. He's rigid and hard cover. Um, this is what we primarily use for a lot of physical walls and things like that. So that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about. And it's mostly what I have a lot of experience in. I have less experience in drops and pan drops just because here at UT, we don't have the space to paint them and we don't have a fly system to fly it in um, in, in two of our three spaces. So um, they tend to not get come up too often. So we tend to be dealing with a lot of flats and that's primarily what I'm going to be talking about today. It could be a whole nother one of these things on painting drops, if not five. So, so hardcover flats tend to get covered um, in a kind of muslin. Well, if we're doing it properly, we're covering them in muslin. It used to be that a lot of Luan, this, this wood here that we cover our flats in, had a lot more chemicals in it and that would seep through the paint. And so you, you had to coat everything in, in muslin. But nowadays that, that's not as much of a problem and so I don't do it all the time. But sometimes instances really require it. Um, like this is a sample for the moon for our town that we did recently. And I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of that to illustrate some of this. But so to prep that surface, you're coating it with the muslin and to do that, I'm going to demo some stuff. Our first demo. Uh, and I've got, well, before I do that, maybe I should talk about the different cover covers we could do. So this is muslin. It's lightweight. Um, it's sort of like a canvas, but not really. It's, it's, this is a medium weight technically. They make it in a heavy weight and they make it in a lightweight, but um, medium weight tends to be the best. Heavy weight seems to be much more like canvas and it has a lot of texture to it. And a lot of times you want, you don't want that texture. You want your surface to be smooth. So, um, um, and the lightweight tends to be for a lot of things too thin. So medium is just perfect. I'm just going to sort of show you how to put this on here. But um, so in order to do that, muslin doesn't come, muslin is not, it's not pre-shrunk. So it shrinks up on you and which is great. Actually, it gets rid of all these nasty wrinkles, which is perfect. And um, in order to get it to do that, you need to have some kind of adhesive or glue for drops and things you'll, you would use animal glue or um, starch. Um, and this is just like regular Argo laundry starch. It's a little harder to find these days, but you can still get it on Amazon. It used to be that you could just get it at a grocery store, but less so now. And those give you really nice, like both that and um, 
the animal glue give really nice smooth surfaces, which is great for painting drops. For the walls and things, it's a little less necessary to have that kind of smoothness. So for cheapness, we'll just use, um, we'll use mixtures of glue and water. Just, and I'm just talking about giant jugs of good old fashioned Elmer's. <laughs> and uh, glue and water. And we might put some color in it too, if you wanted. You could put um, a little bit of white in it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. When you're sitting down to size anything like this, whether it's a drop, a um, theatrical flat, or this, you kind of have to move quickly and you have to do the whole thing at once. Um, there's no stopping and coming back. If you stop and then come back to it, to sizing it, it'll leave a mark wherever you stopped. So that ain't good. So I tend to do a little bit underneath on a hard surface first so that it stays in place and doesn't move around on me so much. But because it's porous, it will go through the fabric. And you kind of work from the outside in, or I'm sorry, that inside out. That's the opposite of what you should do. And you can see it starts to shrink and it gets rid of all the wrinkles. And as you can imagine, you have to move really quickly and on a large flat, it's stressful. You gotta go, you gotta go fast. And having enough people sometimes, you may have to have extra help to really make it go quickly. All right, let's quickly finish this up so we can move on to other things. But you're getting the gist, I imagine. And this is really thin, you can see. You can see it's really, really thin. Um, maybe too thin, and you can always, thicker is not bad. It just is harder to apply to the surface. And once it dries and everything, it's ready to be painted and it's good to go. Um, if this were a flat that had to meet another flat, you might, once it's dry, trim it off of bef just before the edge and not on the edge. So you might trim it here so that when it meets the next flat, there's a, it's, it's not wavy or bumpy. But um, can't have too much because it's sticking. So that is that. And then you would just trim off the excess on the end, if there is any. So this is a little mini version of how you uh, muslin cover a flat. But you could pretend that it was a really large flat and we were doing a really big piece of muslin. I have some photos of the moon I mentioned earlier. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and slideshow. So here you can see the moon, it had just been sized, right? We just did what, it, what I was doing and, and covered it completely. You can see it looks kind of blotchy. That's because this has um, white paint in it. Because it's the surface of the moon, I didn't mind it looking blotchy and I wanted it to sort of look a little blotchy. So um, I went ahead and mixed some white paint into the size. Um, and you can see it's stretched really nicely and the edges are all wrinkly. And then we'll just cut all that excess off. Um, and here it is where it's trimmed. And I don't remember if I added any more color or not to it underneath. I don't think I did actually. And then what I did was a series of sprays. I'm gonna talk more about sprays later, but just in case I don't get to them, I'm using a medium sized garden sprayer to actually get all that texture. And that's sort of the base surface of my moon. Then I drew all the things on there, all the blotches for the moon. And here is why I wanted to show you this is because it was really important to have <clears throat> the muslin on the surface of this moon so I could get these really beautiful blends and the subtle color of the moon. So there it is all trimmed up and neat. It's got some texture on it. Here you can see I've cartooned in all of the blotches and I used a um, overhead projector to do that, um, which is fine for some things, especially organic things because um, this is a really large moon, but overhead projectors tend to get a lot of distortion in them after once you start getting really big. So if you're trying to use an overhead projector to create stuff with straight lines, you might be sad because they will not stay straight. But for this, if there's a little bit of distortion, it doesn't really matter so much. Here it is all finished. You can see that there's, there's texture underneath that, right? So, and then we built up and we built up color and it gives it a lot of depth. 
here it is in the space and Dave is modeling it for us about to be raised in the air. All right, stop share. Next. So similarly, you would have to do the same thing with styrofoam or anything that's not a hard surface. So foam comes in lots of different kinds, right? You might be more familiar with that bead foam, that stuff that comes with packaging a lot. This is that blue foam you can get at hardware stores, usually for insulation, or it might be purple, like me on. Um, and usually you're at the hardware store, you're going to see it more thin like this, but you can order it up to three inches, which is fantastic. And carves really well. You can also get things like ethafoam, which is really loose um, plastic cording, essentially. Um, but all of it, because it's bendy, because it's um, a wonky, weird surface, it's harder to seal it in. It, it can get damaged really easily. You can see you could just chip it off if an actor bumps into it. So you have to coat it with something. So similarly, you can coat it with um, muslin. Depending, like this shape would work pretty well with muslin because it's a square and that would be okay. But if it's like a chunk of rocks, it's going to be really irregular and you're going to get a lot of creases and folds from the muslin. So there are better options to muslin. They make like this gauze. You can get a kind of gauze. It's got weaves are kind of on the bias, so it has some stretch back and forth. Um, it's a little bit more industrious than um, cheesecloth is my favorite. You might see it from the cooking aisle in your grocery store, right? Or on a Halloween decoration. And um, you can see here, it's very open weave. Let me get some of this stuff out of the way here so you can see it. And because it's so weird and irregular, it can stretch any which way. It works really well on moldable surfaces. I have a good example of it here. Here I've got this um, rabbit, <laughs> cooked rabbit and cooked rabbit leg. This is all um, upholstery foam covered in cheesecloth. See if I can get it a little bit closer to the camera. So it's got I don't know if you can see the texture on it, but the texture looks really nice, almost has a skin like texture, which is great. So this stuff works well for that. In a pinch, you can also, if you don't have cheesecloth, although it's very, very cheap, if you've got scrap um, scrim, that'll work. But it's, it's got a little less stretch, so it doesn't want to do it as well as the cheesecloth does. I use um, scrim because that's what I happen to have on hand to make um, these rocks for this rock pit. Doesn't look very pretty on the inside. I should disclaimer that a lot of these textures are not meant to be viewed from up close. This is meant to be viewed on stage. So sometimes they look a little janky up close, but this was used with scrim and this has had several coats of paint now. So the scrim texture did not really show up as much as it did when I first made it. But that scrim texture does stick around longer than say the cheesecloth does. And it's a little bit more of a regular pattern than the cheesecloth, so fire beware. Another thing you can use um, is spandex actually. I like using spandex. Um, it's got a lot of good stretch in one direction, less so in the other direction though. So it works really super well, especially for things that like need to look more like skin or more organic. For instance, I have this roast turkey. This was made with foam and then covered in spandex so you can get that nice skin, that tight skin vibe around there and around there. Um, but you'll see underneath it's just blue foam and pulled spandex, which you know works. But I like this, so I use this a lot with puppetry and puppets because they can get nice skin and by stretching on the surface really tight. So works super great. So that's another good coating. Sometimes you don't need to co cover something with uh, a fabric material at all. You can just go straight to like the texture or, um, so we've got a lot of different kinds of coatings. A very, 
probably the most common one that you can find in your store is the joint compound or sometimes it's called um, sheetrock compound or drywall compound that's what I'm trying to think of and it's you know that that kind of goose that they use on the drywall um, it's not terribly expensive you can get it in giant bucket fulls which is handy sometimes it's too thick you can thin it down with water it won't hold the texture quite as well but you could also put some glue in it and that will help keep things tight. Then for a theater, they make a number of different kinds of coatings. Oh, this is so heavy. Foam coat, also by Roscoe. Roscoe has sort of like the monopoly market on all of this stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and just grab some more of these. Foam coat's really cool. It acts a lot like the joint compound. It's more expensive, but it has all kinds of fibers inside of it. When it dries, it kind of holds everything together a little bit better. Um, so that's good for in case it gets bumped by an actor or whatnot, it'll help keep it from chipping. Um, but it acts very much like joint compound. So this is sort of your cheap version. This is more of your theatrical version. Both of them can be thinned down with water. All of these that I'm gonna talk about can be thinned down or have paint mixed in with them. Granted, if you mix in paint with it, it's going to thin it naturally. So um, then there's things like Sculptor Coat, not a Roscoe product for a change. Um, this can, you can kind of build this up and it's a little bit more moldable. I don't know why I, people love it and swear by it. I don't love it as much for some reason. I don't know why I, it tends to be extra lumpy and I'm not a fan of the lumps, but um, it does coat it. It's much more plasticky. Um, what's great about Sculptor Coat and then this next one, Crystal Gel, again, Russ goes back. These are really plasticky and they will um, shift and move. So if you've got a piece of that um, ethafoam, for instance, and it is bent, you know, really bent around the corner or might get bumped, um, instead of chipping when it indents, like this stuff really sticks and um, will move with it because it's rubberier. Again, they can be thinned down and added color into them. Otherwise, they're mostly clear, but they are really great for soft surfaces and soft materials. Like I used the crystal gel on the turkey and that helped give me that really great smooth but soft apply. All right. You can also use some of those, particularly the plaster um, and the, the foam coat in a pipe, piping bag like you would with frosting and you can use it to create details on the surfaces of things with that. So that's good if you're doing like, what's the neoclassical French with all the beautiful like detail on a wall, or you could use it actually for props by actually making frosting with it, that's hard. <laughs> um, if you thin that out though, it will not hold the detail of your piping instrument so well. So just be aware of that. Other coatings you can use would be things like paper mache, right? This um, table covering is made with craft paper. Um, craft paper works really great for doing like paper mache. You don't just have to stick to newspaper like when you're a kid. Craft paper is perfect. It comes in giant rolls. And there's those things like um, plaster bandages, like from casts and things. You can find them at craft stores and sometimes at medical supply stores. Um, yeah, and you can also do unusual coatings of things. Some of the unusual one that I like to talk about because it was both fun, challenging, and a bit of a nightmare is, is mirror. I'm just gonna go ahead and screen share and show you some of the mirror. So this is a mirror floor we created for Jekyll and Hyde. This is a regular, um, Masonite floor like you, we would normally use for platforms and such, but covered in a mirror. It's a, it's, it's a silver metallic mirror paper. And we used wheat paste and glue to get it onto the surface. And then India inked, which is a little hard to see there for the texture. Luckily I have a sample here as well that I can show you if it shows up okay. 
So there's all kinds of unusual, you kind of see how shiny it is, but it's got that distressed look and we used India ink with that. So that was just used with this metallic mirror paper. It's made by Shamrock Retail Packaging. Um, and it was applied, like I said, with wheat paste. I protected it on the floor with um, a lot of floor wax, which I might talk to. It used to be called Future Floor Wax, right? Um, but now it's now it was bought by Pledge and it's Pledge Revive It. So um, that's that old school Future Floor Wax that you might have heard about or seen your parents use or grandparents or who knows. Um, but it's been around a long time and the formula is the same. It still smells like apples, which I love. Um, but several, several coats of that on this mirror. And what we're trying to do is like the silver is really not really mirror, right? So what you're trying to do is use the gloss, the, the high gloss wax to make, to sort of trick you into getting a reflection so that it reflects kind of like mirror. And if it were true mirror, especially on a floor like that, it would have been very distracting. And so while I was trying to make people think it was mirror, I also didn't really want it to be real mirror because that would be a lot. <laughs> um, you can use all kinds of things to potentially coat a surface if you're clever and a lot of people have come up with their own things. All right, let's get into actual texture and tools. Oh wait, there's one last thing I was going to mention. So you can use things like fiberglass or resin to coat things. Um, that's a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> you have to buy the two part resins and then have the fiberglass stuff and you know all kinds of gear to wear. I tend to avoid it if I can. But um, and using it on foam can be a little iffy because it will because the resins heat when they're mixed they tend to melt the foam just slightly. And so it'll misshape whatever it is that you're trying to coat it in resin. There are ways around it, but it's a headache, but it does exist. It's a thing you could do. <laughs> All right, so texture tools and demo. All right, I have got um, this little, little wee baby flat here. And I'm going to use some of that joint company. And so what I, one tool for texture that works really well are these putty knives. And there are lots of different kinds, right? There's plastic and there's metal and there's different sizes, even the really big ones. And I think even for drywall, you can get the really, really big ones. But so depending on what you need it for, for this, I'm going to use a medium sized plastic. I'm just gonna apply it to the surface. The spatula, sorry, not spatula. Never know what to call them. Putty knives, there we go. Literally written on my sheet of paper and I still forget every time. So you can see you can kind of get a really cool texture just with the knives if you want. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit more. I'm going to do several things with it. Hopefully it does not dry on me. It shouldn't. So that's one thing you can do. You can just go ahead and use the putty knife for, to add the texture like that. You can use sponges. I'm going to dip it in a little bit of water first so that it doesn't get all stuck inside there. A little bit of water. You can dab it on there and it'll give it this like, are you able to see that at all? Good. So that gives you a really nice texture. And I'll talk about this more with sponging later, but you want to really make sure you're always turning the sponge in different directions so that it's not all looking the same. Once that dries, that would give a nice little texture, right? You can kind of see that. Put that in the water so it doesn't dry out. <laughs> so you can also do that, but then it combine it with just using a plain old block of wood, nice and smooth. And you can use that to kind of smooth over the surface. I might need, technically you're supposed to let this dry a little bit and I can see why it's not really working like I would like. But you can kind of see it worked here in this area a little bit. You know, it's really hard to tell. Um, and that would, if this were partially dry, it would sort of 
smooth out some areas and then leave some other areas rough, which kind of gives you a little bit of like a stucco-y plaster vibe, which can be great. I've seen a sample of someone who's created like crumbling plaster using, um, you know that carpet foam that you put underneath your carpet? It's all that weird chippy foam. I don't know if you've seen that. I forget what it's called, but I've seen that all torn up and then covered with this kind of loop and stuff and then painted and it looked like crumbling away plaster and that was really cool. I was highly impressed. All right. Um, you can also um, use a really old stiff brush and, and brush through it and you can get a really great grain out of it. Sometimes you really need to emphasize wood grain and in a really physical way. And so you can do that. I don't know how well you guys can see this or not. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And so you can use grain that way too, or grain, a brush that way. So this is scenic art for the theater. This is Susan Crabtree and Peter Boydert. Um, it's an amazing book if you're really interested in, in Scenic painting, this is the book for you. It has literally everything in it. Probably gonna try this guy here. So um, apart from just using these as is, you can add things into this stuff, right? Whether it's um, joint compound or foam coat or whatever it is, you can add things like sand or um, perlite and vermiculite, which are soil additives. There, those are those plastic things you might find in your soil, the, when you buy that soil, bags of soil or whatever. You can buy them from um, landscaping supply places. <clears throat> so it's a little less common, but those things are really great for that and it's super, super lightweight. Um, there's also all kinds of other stuff. There's other kinds of mulch bits. Let's see if this will work. So you can see there's a lot of different variety in there. You know, the more sand you use or the more of something you use, the chunkier it gets. You can get creative, but if you're using a natural material, I would just be cautious a little bit because over time it could actually start to rot or go bad. So if you're trying to keep something for a long time, you might not want to use something that is more natural. But that book is great. Buy it <laughs> if you're interested in that. Well, there's also these kinds of foam rollers. This would be very similar though to, um, to using just a regular sponge, but might go faster. But you can like, and it would leave some great stuff going on in there. It's starting to get a little bit dry, so it may not work out super great. But again, I hope you can see that okay. Got the grain going on too, so it's double, double action there. But those, I'll show you the texture roller again later when we're talking about sponging. But those are uh, anything you can use, it takes a lot of cleverness. I have um, some other additives you can use on a surface. I'm gonna put this away now. Uh, I have a couple samples here. This is a Stone sample. So this stone was carved out using the, the CNC router. So we have a fancy router. It cuts things out. <laughs> we love it. Um, it did leave a lot of grooves from the router and everywhere, so we had to really sand it. But then we also added in some popcorn ceiling stuff. So they, they do make that popcorn ceiling patch that you can buy to patch your, your, your horrible 70s popcorn ceiling. Um, and uh, you can use that to get a little bit of texture. Also, this had already been, we sanded this as well, and then it got painted a uh, number of colors and number of layers, like I was talking about before. There's like three or four layers of stuff on here. And some highlight and some shadow to make it all pop. And similar to that is this one. This one is from Playmakers Rep, actually. They let me have this, which I was very, nice of them but this is for that sort of alleyway brick you know it's really dark and brown and dirty and mostly doesn't look like brick anymore so it's you can kind of see the highlights here where it's gotten bunged up but this was used this this used stow coat which is an, uh, an additive you can buy i have not used it myself 
but it used Stokoe with elastomeric, which is another one that um, I didn't talk about with the other coatings that you can use. Elastomeric, it comes in big five gallon buckets. It's typically used for, um, it's very, it's plastic, but it's rubber, but paint, it's a, a weird stuff. It's used for coating like the roof of uh, industrial buildings, right? So it's water resistant and all that stuff when it dries. But it's still paintable somehow. I don't know how this works, but it's really great. So you, this is um, snow coat mixed with elastomeric on top of that that brick that you can buy in the, in the store at like Lowe's or Home Depot. And then it's repainted completely after that and with several, several layers the, for the brick and then the mortar and then the, the grungy gray, dark gray over all of it. But a really wonderful sample. Thank you to Playmakers for letting me have it. Um, um, you can add, that's, that's a lot of, a lot of stuff you can add into these textures. All right, now. So you can also make, I mean, you could also use a fabric like before. You could use fabric to make textures on surfaces as well. Um, but we'll get more to that in a bit. You could also make a stencil for it. Um, and I think I'm gonna share my screen and show you an example. So this is not with texture specifically, but um, this is a stencil we created to, to um, so this is a painted texture, right? This isn't a physical texture, but we created the stencil so we could spray this polka dot pattern onto things. And uh, it worked really well, looked really great, wonderful pop art. But um, you could also do this with brick. You could create a stencil that is the mortar and spray on the texture of like a brick if you did not want to use the store-bought kind or you could use it to create all you know a stencil for all kinds of things like that all right you could use some of those plastic coatings as well the um uh, on plexiglass so this is the crystal gel on plexiglass all it did was sort of create that dapple look and make it so it's not 100% super translucent. It's a little tricky to see, but it was a leaded window that went into a clear story above a door, right? Um, but we didn't want it to, it's really dusty, my apologies. But we didn't want it to be completely perfectly see-through, right? So we just used um, a sponge and the crystal gel and it did really great stuff for this plexiglass. All right, let's move on to heat textures. So that's a lot of the stuff on physical textures. Physical textures can be like, for every project you might need a thing, it might have a completely different process. Um, so I'm just trying to show you some of the things that we could use. But like if we needed to create a tree trunk, there's like five, plus more ways to kind of create that tree trunk, um, depending on what it is. If it's like a birch, you might use like craft paper so you can get that peely paper look. Or if it's a really chunky cedar, you might really want to use foam um, and, um, and uh, uh, like muslin to really get to coat it. So it just depends on what it is. And it's always a bit of a process. The answer is always testing. You want to do tests for everything, lots and lots of tests, um, and try stuff out uh, and just see what works. It's a, lot, it's a lot of trial and error to figure out some of these things. So um, yeah, I'm going to move on to some painted textures. Uh, I'm going to need another one of my little flats. Um, and some more. I'm going to use that sponge we used earlier. I'm going to talk a little bit about sponging. We can get some more water out of this. All right. So in here, I just have some cream colored paint. It was used for ragtime last semester. Last semester? Was it really just last semester? Wow. 
this year, am I right? All right. <laughs> so this is just your natural sponge, the kind you can get at uh, craft stores and things, right? On the outside, it's got this really great texture out here, but on the inside, it also has really great texture. I tend to like the inside texture better because it's more irregular and interesting. But you can use both, and that's what's great. So you can get a really good. So you'll notice I'm spinning this thing constantly. What I'm trying to avoid is that is that uh, look you might have seen in your grandmother's bathroom from the 90s, where all the sponging looks all exactly the same and it's repeated because they're never turning their sponge. So what you're trying to avoid with any kind of texture really is pat is pattern. Our brains love pattern, and so. We tend to go toward pattern even when we're not noticing. So you often have to pay a lot of attention to, to what you're doing with your hands to avoid pattern and making patterns. So I could go back over this now and probably break it up and it would be fine. Often with sponging, you want heavier texture than less texture for the same exact reason that I just was talking about. Not necessarily in this case because of pattern, but because you'll see the sponge shape. Right, like you'll keep seeing that sponge shape over and over again. So the more you're spinning, the tighter the texture, um, the less likely that'll happen. And, and that's a good thing. So you're like, what is this texture? What is it for? It's for all kinds of stuff. And <laughs> like all scenic paint, it's going to be layered with several other things on top of it, right? And uh, I have a couple examples of that on to screen share. And share oh i didn't talk about this earlier so when i was talking about plexiglass i could have mentioned this so these are some windows from ragtime and this was made with um that window stretch plastic that you just heat seal over your windows right with tape it works really well and super lightweight if you're going to have a lot of interaction with actors it tends to wobble a lot so you may not want to use it for everything, especially if it's in a window, for instance, that has a door nearby that slams and makes it wobble. Not super great for that. But for this use, it was worked great. And in this case, I mixed um, that floor wax with some paint to get it to stick to the plastic because the plastic does not like to take paint. So sometimes you can add additives of like crystal gel or the floor wax um, to try and get it to stick to things. And it worked really well for that. So all of those windows, and there was a whole lot of them, were created um, texture meant to sort of look like a heavy iron. So you can see here, what you're looking at there in that photo is, I think, literally three or four different layers of sponging and colors. So every, every one of those windows and every one of those pieces of scenery for that show, because almost the whole set was made out of this stuff, had to get covered with several different layers worth of texture. And so underneath there is a really strong Payne's gray texture on a light gray or medium gray, I should say. Then there's some rust texture. So we add a little bit of rust sponging. And then we added a whole lot of um, this um, tarnish color on top. And then we come back and add a little bit more. You can see some areas are heavier than others. So we would add some more to get some variety. Because again, we don't want it to all look like pattern. We want some variety. Here's some more sponge texture with gold. And so this is us trying to create a very tarnished gold. So the base color for this was a black. And then on top of that was sort of a, a yellowish sienna color because it's very similar to the shade of gold. And then we, we spun, this is all um, sponged. And then we sponged actual shiny gold on top of that to, for some of it so that it would look it would make you think the whole thing was gold when in actuality it was only sponged a little bit of gold very tricksy and then there was a darker brown that we used to sort of shadow stuff and make it look aged in the corners and things but all of that set looked like that here's a, another example of it lit up and you can see next to um that proscenium piece is also this other physical texture and those happen to be um Ceiling tiles you can buy for your um, your drop ceiling, and they come in a variety of textures these days. If you look for them, you can find all kinds of fun things, including things that look like old-fashioned tin and whatnot. Um, and we painted those up to match everything else with the gold, and it looked really great. Um, and really happy with that. All right, so let's 
stop that. So it doesn't look like a whole lot here, but when you're combining it with a bunch of other stuff, um, it works out really, really well. And then, like I said, scenic paint is about layering. So if I wanted to make this into something more, I'd probably layer over some really thin browns and it might end up looking like a something. I'm not sure what it looks like. Okay, so brushes. I mean, brushes are pretty obvious, right? You paint things with brushes. But you can also do, um, you can get a lot of good texture out of these. Um, I need two colors. So um, a basic scumble, or there's there's also wet blending. They're very very similar, but oh, that's not the brush I was going to use. Just two days. You can see it's kind of thinned down. And then you can lay another color next to it, and then you just blend the two together. And then maybe add some more. And more. And again, you're trying to avoid patterns and you're trying to avoid blotchiness, but it can get that way. But this works well. Like, so for instance, that um, Playmaker's brick sample I showed you earlier, the brick colors that were sort of underneath it were created with a scumble of a two different brick, brickish colors that kind of spread out across the surface. And then the grouting was lined in gray and it broke everything up and it looked really lovely. And then the other layers of the dark color went on top of it and suddenly that looks like something. A uh, really handy technique. It's used for a lot of things. I use it on floors a lot, especially if they're um, dirt colored. I think I have some images to screen share for that. Oh, so here's also an image of a wet blend. This is a wood grain wet blend. So for wood, instead of being blotchy, this is different colors laid next to each other to give you a variety of shades for wood. So it's very similar, but for a different purpose and a different texture. And then this is an unfinished floor for Beowulf, Lord of the Bros. It's a combination of wet blending and, and spat sprays. There's a better finished picture of it there. You can kind of see the texture close up. The last few layers had a lot of sprays in it, but you can see the blotchy kind of color texturation underneath there. And then some slate stone looking stuff there for the weird dragon knots. Do I have another example? Nope. Okay. Stop share. Next thing on the list. So, okay, we also have brushes because this is the brush section. If I can please. We have brushes like this that are all cut apart, right? They're all cut into jaggedy chunks. And you can use that to create grain. Um, so maybe not the perfect color for this, but uh, you can do grain through things to give you some wood for woodness. And so you would layer this on top of or with that uh, that wet blended wood that we looked at in the slide, and um, that would help create really great wood. Um, but that's a Handy trick. Sometimes it's a little too cartoony and you have to kind of do it a little bit judiciously and not too heavily. But any like old brush, like this brush is really old. This is not a cut apart brush, it's just crappy now. Crappy brushes work really well for this too. Um, and you can get a finer grain out of crappy brushes sometimes. But what else do I have under here under brushes? Oh, there's some spattering, but I'm going to talk about spattering later when I get with sprays and spatters. So, um, but we use brushes for spattering too. Put this in the water so they don't dry out. Okay, let's get into more sponges. Yeah, so I've already showed you some sponge stuff, but sponges come in different kinds, right? So um, there's like the natural sponge we've already talked about. But there's like the kind for your car, or washing your car, or there's this kind, and they all have slightly different texture to them, and so you can get different patterns and things out of them. This one is a really dense foam. Denser foams work really well for things like cutting out shapes. Um, so like, for instance, this little star I used to put little stars on a floor, cut out a foam like this, right? You can cut sh wonderful shapes out of foam. And you can make stamps out of them. So this is a piece of 
foam attached to a stick, essentially, so that I can um, stamp squares. This is for doing little tiny square tiles that went in between, you know, like on a floor that has those black little tiles in between all the other big white tiles. This was a little black tile stamp. <laughs> Very handy on a little stick. You would just attach the Luan piece to the wood first and then attach your foam. Uh, but you can do that with all kinds of shapes that you might need. A lot of what I do happens to be for floors. So a lot of the stuff is about flooring, but um, you can use it for other things too. Um, so we might use, I'm gonna do a screen share again real quick for an example of a set almost entirely painted with sponges. So this is the set for Macbeth. And it was set sort of post-apocalyptic child gang style. Um, but it's, so it's in this abandoned subway station was the, was the idea. So you can kind of see the, the, where they're standing on the floor is where the tracks would be. And then the, up top is the platform for the train. But all of that tile was stamped with a stamp. And it was not just stamped once. Each tile, I think, had three to four layers on it. So it would have a couple different colors. And then it would have like a ceiling or a gloss layer that would get stamped on there so that it would be all nice and shiny like, a, like the tile. And uh, it looked really beautiful and was a whole lot of work. Uh, but, but beware, beware, it's a lot of, a lot of work. All right, yes, did I stop sharing? Yay! Great. So another thing you can do with sponges is you can also like remove paint. And you can do this with rags as well. Um, so for instance, if I have a big piece of molding, like meow, like you can see even in the camera, it washes out completely. Um, and you don't even see any of that detail. So um, I'm, I think I'm actually going to use a rag for this because I'm moving on to rags next anyway. But you could use a sponge as well. And what you would do is you would brush on a, a darker color than whatever your base color is. And then you put, and then you remove it. And it gives you all that great grain. It gives you a little bit of grain, like it's made out of wood, but it also gives you, like, highlights all that detail. And it makes it look like, like dirt has settled into the corners and things, which happens a lot. Whether you realize it or not, no surface is really clean, especially on stage. <laughs> and you could remove more and more if it's too much. I'm like, oh, that's too much. Um, and it looks pretty great and pretty greasy. And you have to, I mean, a lot of times you have to, highlight and shadow things on stage because they wash out. And so even though it may look really cartoony here in the camera on stage, it's gonna naturally shadow from the stage lighting anyway, um, some of it. But it might shadow out, like because this upright might shadow out all that detail underneath it. So even if it does get a little bit of shadow, this will still make it still visible. So it's not always about making things look real. Sometimes it's about making it look real on stage, <laughs> which is different. <clears throat> All right, so um, same way. So I'll go back a little bit to sponges for a few more minutes. Um, like I said, you could use this texture roller. It's super great. I love this thing to death. I think I might actually use this one on the floor over there. Um, so I'm going to come around to the front. Great. I like to use this on plain walls um, to give it. So this is just really dirty water, essentially. It's, it's water with a little bit of paint. Oh, the sunlight is really <laughs> causing some problems. Okay. You know, having a shop with great big windows is amazing and also. So a little bit of dirty water, and normally I use a pole for this, but and it will give it just a little bit of texture that might simulate that texture you get from paint 
right? Just that dapple look. Um, or and you can go heavier, um, and you can get some distressing out of it and make walls look more aged. But it works really well uh, because it's really watery. It'll sort of settle out on its own, and it won't it won't quite look so blotchy. But um, you can also create your own wacky wacky um, rollers. You can buy regular paint rollers um, like these guys. You know that you would have. You can cut into it. You can put rubber bands on it, like this little guy. And you can um, there's a foam roller, right? It's styrofoam, so you can really cut into it, and cut shapes and things into it. And you can roll a lot of amazing patterns and textures. I have a giant. I don't know if this is going to read on camera real really well, but I might give it a shot. This is a project I did in college. It was a painting created entirely like the the the, um, the assignment is you're not allowed to use any brushes. So this is entirely created with texture tools, and I might be spraying, I might be sponging, I might be using spatula, not spatula, putty knives, but no, there's no brush used on this. So you can get really clever with all of the rollers and the sponges and all that stuff to get just about anything you need. It is entirely possible. <laughs> so you can cut things and make great shapes and all kinds of stuff. Um, so rags work really well. Do we have a question? A, a very good question. Oh, great. Yeah. I like good questions. So, <laughs> knowing, knowing you're trying to achieve a look for a perfection. Yeah. How do you know what technique works best under extreme lighting? Oh. Besides your years of experience. Oh, I was going to say experience. Um, can you repeat a little bit again? I just want to make sure I'm clear. Sure. Knowing that you're trying to achieve a given look for uh -huh. production, how do you know what technique will work best under extreme lighting? Um, so often I will take, so testing is part of the answer, right? So we'll create a number of tests for something. That's why I have some of these samples laying around. Um, we, we make samples for things. And then we'll take it out on stage and actually turn the lights on is a great way to do it. Uh, sometimes, again, because of experience, I don't need to do that. But if you don't know and you aren't sure, tests are the answer. Um, and try a couple things out. And it might be that you don't have to test a million times, right? Like it might be that you make one test, you take it out there, look at it under the light, and you go, oh crap, that washes out too much. So I just need to beef it up. And then you have your answer and you know, and you can just move on from there. Um, and you just go, okay, I just need a little bit more of this texture or that texture because it's not reading currently. Um, but testing, I think, is the best answer to that question um, and experience. But um, I think that's my best answer for that. One more question, okay. Sure. Uh, do you have any stage texture pet peeves? Oh, stage texture pet peeves. I have some lighting texture pet peeves. <laughs> um, lighting designers like to add texture sometimes on stage, which is great most of the time, but every now and again. It's like, why are there French fries on my set? Um, but uh, yeah, I, the sponge one bugs me a lot. That's probably why I mentioned it more than once. Um, where bad sponging can look really bad. <clears throat> I think the thing that I, I think the biggest overall pet peeve I would say is like, is if um, someone's doing a texture of whatever it is, but, and that's just it. Right, there's no other layering to it. There's no other depth created for it. Um, so basically, all of these samples I've created, like this, would drive me crazy on stage because there's nothing else to it. It doesn't actually have a whole lot of depth. It needs some more layers to it. So if I perceive something that feels like texture laziness, <laughs> that might drive me crazy on stage. Okay, so next one is rags. This this is a T-shirt or was. So, rags. You can use rags of paint. I'm going to use gloves because this gets messy. 
Oh my God, I'm eating up my 10 minutes <laughs> by putting on gloves. <laughs> oh, we do need a few minutes of the end, that's true. But yes, so you can just get your drag all full of it. And, um, and then you can, a lot of people will roll it, right? Oops, you can't see that. <laughs> so you can roll that texture. You can, like the sponge, you can blotch it around. I like this one with stone a lot because the edges look more irregular, but more um, like, like actual stone than say like a sponge, right? That's a really fine texture. This is a little chunkier. And I like the chunkiness of it. And again, you want to avoid like repeating the same pattern over and over again and dragging your rag through it because oops. So that's not so great. Um, let's see. And you can use different kinds of fabric. will give you different kinds of texture too. Like if you've got an old Henley t-shirt or an old Henley shirt, a waffle weave, right? Or um, um, a heavy terry cloth. You're going to get different textures out of those on the surface as well. Um, so you can also just irregularly drop it as another technique. Or you can make an uber ragger and attach a whole bunch of rags to a stick. And then you can slap it around all over like crazy. Um, and I think I have an example of that. Um, okay, so yeah, I missed this earlier. This is a, a piece of cabaret. This was a wall where I used um, the subtraction method with rags. So sort of like I did with that piece of molding where I removed color. This is the same thing, except I'm brushing it on a whole big surface and then removing a lot of it with a, a wet rag. And it gives you that great distressed, um, heavy distress texture. Like this is heavy texture compared to like that roller I did a minute ago. But this is what the one I was, so this was going to be the floor for Vanya, Sonia, and Masha and Spike. This is as far as it got before we shut down last spring. And this was created using the Uber ragger here, the, the rag flogger as we call it. Um, and you're just slapping it around like crazy. And it was gonna turn into a whole bunch of stonework for the floor. But alas, it was not to be. Um, so, but we do have this amazing Uber Ragger now as a result. Um, and it does great stuff. It's really crunchy because it's it had a lot of pain in it. Um, so the floggers are really cool in general. This is one just made out of muslin. This one we is made mostly just to use with um, removing chalk lines and things from floors. So you can slap it around and it takes the chalk out. But you could also use one of these for paint as well. It would be a really heavy texture, but it could be it could be used as well. This thing's looking old. We might need to make a new one. <laughs> it might be 10 years old now. Um, so another heavy texture guy that I really like are feather dusters. So this is an old feather duster. It's obviously seen better days. <laughs> I have a newer one as well. That one's much better. But I keep them around because they give you different textures, right? The new one and the old one give you different looks. Um, I think I'm going to use this. So you want to get some of the excess paint off of it. But you can drop it and it gives you all this kind of stuff going on. Now if I used this guy, this might be too thick of a paint for this. <laughs> might be a little bit much, but yeah, that's kind of heavy. Can't have it all right, but it's still a cool texture and it's a really different look, right? This looks really good for like organic or grassy surfaces and things like that. Like I said, you combine it with other things. I have an image for this one. That looks really great. This was, um, so you can see the floor there is made with the feather dusting texture and it kind of, so it's combined with thin layers of other browns on top of it and maybe even some spattering. 
but all together it kind of makes it look like a really rough, uh, muddy, uh, maybe a lot of straw or hay kind of texture on the floor. Um, and that was for Fiddler on the Roof. And that's what I was going for. I was trying to get that hay or straw and mud kind of vibe for that show. And it worked great. Trying to power through, get as much as we can in the next few minutes. <clears throat> but we're almost out of time. But we almost made it, y'all. Um, a lot of people also use feathers for um, doing veining and marble, right? So you get those really fine, detailed veins um, with marble, and you can sort of flip flop and move around. And I'm going to be doing a whole other workshop on marble, so come back for that, and you'll see this dude in action. Um, <clears throat> so spattering. I've been talking about it for a while, but now's our chance. Um, so there's a couple different kinds. You can hand spatter things. Um, I need a brush that's semi-clean, y'all. I'm going to try and do this real quick. I'm coming out for All right. So you can spatter by hand. It hurts after a while, so if you're doing a really large area, um, beware. So you're just tapping and you're getting that fine spatter texture. The nice thing about this version of, of spattering is that it really looks pretty irregular, and that's really great. Um, you can also do things where you're moving it really funkily and you can get bigger variety in there, right? So, are you able to see that? Yeah, so you can kind of wobble it. So I'm really loosely holding it in my hand and just like jostling it around. <clears throat> but you can also, if you have big areas to do, we use garden sprayers a lot. This guy, as you can see, is covered in paint. I have a bunch of different ones. They make, they make them in different sizes. Let me go ahead and get us. Fresh, clean surface. Yeah, kind of. So these guys, you put the paint in, it has to be a little bit thinner. You got to pump it up from where the air pressure. And you, there it goes. And you can get a nice even spray. You can get a really super heavy. This is how I did the moon. And you can keep going and more and more spray. You can use multiple layers and different colors. I like this guy. This guy's my favorite thing. <laughs> they make the big garden sprayer, and you, those work really well too, especially if you have big areas. Um, but I, I don't tend to use it as much. Um, they work really great for drops, though, because you can get really big swaths of fine mist, right? So there are other kinds of sprayers. So let me. Talk about two other sprays real quick, right? We got just hand hand bottles. Um, this is more for like distressing, and they make different sizes, right? Sometimes you want smaller. Automotive sprayers. This is like with compressed air. This is like will give you super fine airbrush look. They work great for that, although I don't use it all that often. You got the hopper, <laughs> which is for actual texture. You can put thin down plaster and stuff in this thing, and it will spray out goop all over the place. I think that's my timer telling me I'm out of time. <laughs> so, um, and lastly, this is an example of a bigger garden sprayer, right? It's got the hose attached. Um, it's covered in dust, so you can kind of tell I don't use it a lot. But we have it if we need it. All right. That's probably about all I'm going to get. Oh, one last thing with the spatter, I forgot. Maybe some more. You can do, and I'm going to go over this with the wood grain again. So um, once you've got paint down like that, you can also take a really dry brush with no paint or water in it. 
and you can pull through it and it gives you this nice drag look which works really well if you want wood that looks like it's eaten or really warm or distressed. Um, usually it's not quite this big of droplets, but hey, actually I kind of like it. So, so we'll do that on, um, on wood grains and wood that need to look really beat up. All right, so we'll talk more about that spattering technique and the other graining tools and we'll be doing wood. Um, and there's some varieties of wood in there, so it'll be more specific than this. This was a big survey of a lot of stuff. That's going to be much more focused, um, much more technique oriented. So, and they all will from now on, because I'm doing stone after that the next week, and then marble after that the week after. So, come back for that. And um, I actually didn't get, I actually made it pretty far on here. Just the only other thing I didn't get to do is was distressing. And I'm going to cover splashing and marble, and so because splashing is another one. So come back for those, and we'll we'll be talking about them anyway. So thank you guys so much. Hopefully you found it interesting and helpful.